Chapter Five of the Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Five: The Initiation. San Francisco possesses one great advantage: you can easily get out of it. Leaving the panhandle of the park behind one, and following the turn of the cars, one passes through a pretty valley, green and fair as any garden, and dotted with small houses. An old cemetery lies to one side of it, where unconventional inscriptions and queer epitaphs can be traced on the half-buried stones, covered with a tangle of vines and weeds still moving forward one reaches olympus and climbing to its heights one sees away below in the far distance the coast range like a rampart of strength the blue waters of the bay sparkling and dancing in the sunlight steamers flashing their path on its bosom and tiny white specks scudding in the breeze below is the city its houses small and closed in like toy villages and christmas boxes whilst the slopes around are green with fresh grass and here and there are thick clusters of eucalyptus and pines the ocean is partly hidden from view by a peak which rises directly to the west and is separated from that on which one is standing by a deep and thickly wooded valley descending by means of a narrow winding path one passes through dense clumps of hickory chestnut mountain ash and walnut trees whose strong lateral branches afford ample protection from the sun, and at the same time furnish playgrounds to innumerable bright-eyed squirrels. Further down one comes upon gentle elms, succeeded by sassafras and locust, these in their turn succeeded by the softer linden, redbud, catalpa, and maple, and at the foot of the declivity, and in the bottom of the valley, wild shrubbery interspersed with silver willows and white poplars. Still following the path down the vale in a southerly direction, one at length finds oneself in an amphitheatre, shut in on all sides by trees and bushes of a still greater variety. Here and there a gigantic and much benarled oak, here a triple-stemmed tulip-tree of some eighty feet in height its glossy vivid green leaves and profuse blossoms presenting a picture of unsurpassed beauty and splendour there equally beautiful though in marked contrast a tall and slender silver birch the floor of the amphitheatre is for the most part grass soft thick velvety and miraculously green the silence is such as makes it wholly inconceivable that so vast a city as san francisco can be little over six miles distant though one may strain one's ears to the utmost nothing is to be heard but the occasional tinkling of a cowbell the lowing of cattle and the desultory note of birds it is the perfect quiet which nature alone can give and it so impressed hamar that he at once decided that this was the very spot essential for the ceremony of initiation into the black art locality selected the night had next to be chosen and the conditions demanding that on the night of the initiation there must be a new moon cusp of the seventh house and conjoined with saturn in opposition to jupiter Footnote. This is a very sinister sign in astrology denoting the presence of evil influences of all kinds. Author's note. Hamar and his confederates had to wait exactly three weeks from the date of the conclusion of the tests before they could proceed. Shortly before midnight, on the spot already described, Hamar, Curtis, and Kelson met, and after searching thoroughly amongst the trees and bushes in the vicinity of the amphitheatre to make sure no one was in hiding, they commenced operations on a perfectly level piece of ground a circle of seven feet radius was clearly defined the circle was cut into seven sectors and an inner circle from the same centre with a radius of six feet was next drawn in each part of the sectors between the circumferences of the first and second circle were inscribed in chalk the names of the seven principal vices according to the atlantean ideas and the seven most malignant diseases within the second circle and using the same center was drawn a third circle of five feet in radius and in each part of the sectors between the circumferences of the second and third circles 
were written the names of the seven types of spirits most antagonistic to man's moral progress footnote according to atlantean ideas these spirits were vice elementals morbus or disease elementals clonagrians or malicious family ghosts such as banshees etc vampires barovians that is a grotesque kind of phantasm that frequents places where prehistoric man or beast has been interred planetians that is spirits inimical to dwellers on this earth that inhabit various of the other planets and earth-bound spirits of such dead human beings as were mad imbecile cruel vicious together with the phantasms of vicious and mad beasts and of beasts of prey author's note hamar had brought with him a sack the same he had used to transport satan's corpse and from out of it he produced a half-starved tabby that obviously could harm no one owing to the fact that its head was tied up in a muslin bag and its four legs strapped together it's a good thing there is no member of the society for the prevention of cruelty to animals anywhere near kelson exclaimed eyeing hamar resentfully wouldn't a mouse or rat have done as well no hamar ejaculated depositing the brute with a plump on the ground the conditions are that the animal sacrificed must be a cat i got the poorest specimen i could find for i dislike butchering just as much as you do how are you going to do it kelson asked hamar pointed to a chopper the conditions say steel he said only with steel and i should bungle with a knife you must look the other way now help me with the fire besides the cat the sack contained a dozen or so bundles of faggots well steeped in paraffin several blocks of wood a tripod and a big tin saucepan with the wood a fire was soon kindled in the centre of the circle and the tripod placed over it two pints of spring water were then poured into the saucepan and to this were added one ounce of oxalic acid one ounce of verdigris one and a half ounces of hemlock leaves one half ounce of henbane three quarters of an ounce of saffron two ounces of aloes three drams of opium one ounce of mandrake root five drams of selenum seven drams of poppy seed one half ounce of asafetida and one half ounce of parsley as soon as the saucepan containing these ingredients began to boil hamar threw into it two adder's heads three toads and a centipede where on earth did you get all those horrors curtis asked shrinking away from the bag which had held them here hamar said laconically it's extraordinary what a lot of nasty things there are amid so much apparent beauty i say apparent because nature is a champion faker you have only to rake about in those bushes and you'll find snakes galore whilst under pretty nearly every stone are centipedes like both of you who never by any chance poke your noses outside the city i fancied snakes and centipedes were confined to the prairies but i know better now besides where do you think i found the toads why in the cellars under meadlers what our late governors kelson cried hamar nodded yes he said under the very spot where we used to sit the water's a foot deep in that cellar and if there are as many toads in cellars of the other houses in the block then sacramento street has a corner on them i'm going to be executioner now so look the other way matt kelson needed no second bidding and sticking his fingers in his ears walked to some little distance when hamar called him back the deed was accomplished the conditions prescribed in the rites had been observed the tabby was in the saucepan on the fire and its blood had been besprinkled on each of the seven sectors of the circle we must now take our seats on the ground hamar said i'd better be in the centre you matt on the right and you ed on the left allowing three clear feet between us hamar showed them how to sit with legs crossed and arms folded for some minutes no one spoke the wind rustled through the bushes and an owl hooted kelson feeling the night air cold drew his overcoat tightly around and the others followed suit then curtis said do you really think there's anything in it leon aren't we fools to go wasting our time like this to which hamar replied shut up you were frightened enough doing the tests from afar off away on the shimmering bosom of the bay came the faint hooting of a steamer 
that's the oleander kelson murmured rot curtis snapped how do you know you can't tell from this distance it might be the daisy or the san marie or any other ship kelson made no reply hamar blew his nose and once again there was silence the effect of the moonlight had now become weird from the trees and bushes crept legions of tall gaunt shadows and whilst some of these were explicable there were others that certainly had no apparent counterparts in any of the natural objects around them even curtis in spite of his scoffing showed no inclination to examine them too closely but kept his face resolutely turned to the more cheery light of the fire the soft cool sweet scented air gradually acted as an anaesthetic and kelson and curtis were almost asleep when hamar's voice recalled them sharply to themselves it's just two he said sit tight and listen while i repeat the incantation and for goodness sake keep cool if anything happens remember we are here with an object namely to get everything we can out of the other world trust you for that curtis sneered but all the same nothing's going to happen i am not sure of that hamar said and after a brief pause began to repeat these words footnote they are a literal translation of the atlantean by thomas maitland and are very nearly identified with forms of spirit invocation used in egypt india persia arabia and among the red indians of north and south america author's note morbus from the mountains where flow malignant fountains we are ready for you come vampires from the passes where grow blood-sucking grasses we are ready for you come vice elements pretty give ear unto our ditty we are ready for you come planetians forms so fearful we inform you eager tearful we are ready for you come clanagrians things of sorrow postpone not till to-morrow we are ready for you come barovians shade seclusive be not to us exclusive we are ready for you come earthbound spirits of the dead approach with grim and noiseless tread we are ready for you come he then got up and going to the fire sprinkled over the flames six drams of belladonna three drams of drosera and one ounce of nux vomica using in each case his left hand returning to his former position he drew with the forefinger of his left hand on the ground the outline of a club foot a hand with the fingers clenched and a long pointed thumb standing upright and a bat at his request kelson and curtis carefully imitated the devices each in the space allotted to him hamar then cried christi havunan balababu which hamar explained was atlantean for devil of the damned appear he won't curtis muttered because he doesn't exist there are devils meidler brothers are devils but there is no one devil it's all he suddenly stopped and an intense hush fell upon them all a cloud obscured the moon the fire burned dim and the gloom of the amphitheatre thickened till the men lost sight of each other a cold air rose from the ground and fanned their nostrils something flew past their heads with an ominous wail whilst from the direction of the fire came a hollow groan the advent of the unknown hamar murmured shall be heralded in by the shrieking of an owl the groaning of the mandrake there is mandrake in the saucepan the croaking of a toad we haven't had that yet yes there it is kelson whispered and whilst he was speaking there came a dismal croak croak and the swaying and crying of an ash hush they listened and all three distinctly heard the swishing of a slender tree trunk as it hissed backwards and forwards then a cry so horrid harsh and piercing that even the sceptical sneering curtis gave vent to an expression of fear again a hush and increasing darkness and cold kelson called out don't do that leon i am not doing anything hamar said testily pull yourself together a moment later he said to curtis it's you curtis shut up this is no time for monkeying you are both either mad or dreaming curtis replied i haven't stirred from my seat hello what's that what's that leon there over there look as curtis spoke they all three became conscious of living things around them 
things that moved about silently and surreptitiously and conveyed the impression of mockery the hills the valley the trees were full of it the whole place teemed with it teemed with silent subtle stealthy mockery the senses of the three men were now keenly alive but a dead weight hung upon their limbs and rendered them useless and as they stared into the gloom in sickly fear the firelight flickered and they saw shadows such as the moon when low in the heaven might fashion from the figure of a man but yet they were shadows neither of man nor god nor of any familiar thing they were dark vague formless and indefinite and they quivered quivered with a quivering that suggested mockery suddenly the shadows disappeared the flickering of the flames ceased and in the place of the fire appeared a seething writhing mass of what looked like white luminous snakes and in the midst of this mass sprang up a cylindrical form which grew and grew until it attained a height of ten or twelve feet and then it remained stationary and threw out branches and the three men now saw it was a tree a tree with a sleek pulpy semi-transparent perspiring trunk full of a thick white vibrating luminous fluid and that it was laden with a fruit in shape resembling an apple but of the same hue and material as the trunk spread out on the ground around it were its roots twitching and palpitating with repulsive life and bare with a bareness that shocked the senses it was so utterly and inconceivably unlike what hamar curtis and kelson had imagined the unknown and yet withal so monstrous not merely in its shape but its suggestions and so vividly real and livid that they were not merely terrified they were stricken with a terror that rendered them dumb and helpless and as they looked at it from out the trunk shot an enormous thing white and glistening and fashioned like a human tongue and after pointing derisively at them it withdrew whereupon all the fruit shook as if convulsed with unseemly laughter and then they saw between the foremost branches of the tree a big eye the white of it was thick and pasty the iris spongy in texture and the pupil bulging with a lurid light it stared at them with a steady stare insolent and quizzical hamar and his friends stared back at it in fascinated horror and would have continued staring at it indefinitely had not hamar's mercenary instincts come to the rescue he recollected that time was pressing and that unless he got into communication with the strange thing at once according to the book it would vanish and he might never be able to get in touch with it again thus egged on he made a great effort to regain his courage and at length succeeded in forcing himself to speak though his voice was weak and shaking he managed to pronounce the prescribed mode of address that is mrafonin etek mo which being interpreted is spirit from the unknown give ear to me he then explained their earnest desire to pay homage to the supernatural and to be initiated into the mysteries of the black art when hamar had concluded his address the anticipations of the three as to how it would be answered or whether it would be answered at all were such that they were forced to hold their breath almost to the point of suffocation if the thing could speak what would its voice be like the seconds passed and they were beginning to prepare themselves for disappointment when suddenly across the intervening space separating them from the unknown the reply came came in soft silky lisping tones human and yet not human novel and yet in some way a way that defied analysis familiar strange to say they all three felt that this familiarity belonged to a far back period of their existence no less than to a more modern one to a period in fact to which they could affix no date and although a perfect unity of expression suggested that the utterance of the thing was the utterance of one being only a certain variation in its tones arising and falling from syllable to syllable led them to infer that the voice was not the voice of one but many you are anxious to acquire knowledge of the secrets associated with the great atlantean magic the voice lisped we are hamar stammered and we are willing to give our souls in exchange for them souls the voice lisped whilst trunk and branches swayed lightly and the air was full of silent merriment 
souls you speak in terms you do not understand to acquire the secrets of black magic all you have to do is to agree that during a brief period a period of a few months you will live together in harmony that you will make use of the powers you acquire to the detriment of all save yourselves that you will never allow your minds to revert to anything spiritual and that you will abstain from marrying and if we succeed in carrying out the conditions hamar asked then the voice replied you will retain free untrammelled possession of your knowledge for how long curtis queried for the natural term of your lives that is to say for as long as you would have lived had you never been initiated into the secrets of magic and if we fail you will pass into the permanent possession of the unknown does that mean we shall die the moment we fail kelson inquired timidly die the voice lisped again you speak in terms you do not understand you may be sent for you say in perfect harmony hamar put in does that mean without a quarrel however slight it means without a quarrel that would lead to separation the moment you disunite the compact is broken what advantage will the secrets bring us hamar inquired can we gain unlimited wealth yes the voice replied unlimited wealth and influence and health so long as you fulfil the conditions of the compact you will enjoy perfect health will you or will you not pledge yourselves i am ready if you fellows are hamar whispered i am curtis cried anything is better than the life we are living at present and i too kelson said i agree with ed very well then the voice once more lisped each of you take a fruit and eat it and the compact is irrevocably struck you cannot back out of it without incurring the consequences already named don't be afraid step up here and help yourselves one apiece mind no more and again it seemed to hamar curtis and kelson as if the tree and everything around it was convulsed with silent laughter come on hamar cried somewhat imperatively don't waste time you've decided and besides remember this affair may turn out trumps i'll go first and walking up to the tree he plucked a fruit and began to eat it curtis and kelson slowly followed suit i believe i'm eating a live slug or a toad curtis muttered with a wretch and i too kelson whispered it's filthy i shall be sick if i am will it make any difference to the compact i wonder what the fruit really tasted like they could never decide it reminded them of many things and of nothing it was sweet yet bitter it repelled but at the same time pleased them it was as perplexing as the voice as enigmatical when they had eaten it they resumed their former positions on the ground and the voice again addressed them the fruit you have consumed has created in you a fitness to make use of the powers about to be conferred you have acquired the faculty of sorcery you will be initiated by stages into the knowledge and practice of it these stages seven in number will cover the period of your compact that is twenty-one months and at the end of every three months when a fresh stage is reached you will receive fresh powers 
in the first stage the stage you are now entering upon you will receive the power of divination you will be told how to detect the presence of water and all kinds of metals and how to read people's thoughts in the second stage exactly three months from to-day you will receive the gift of second sight the power of separating your immaterial from your material body and projecting it anywhere you will on the physical plane and to a large extent you will be enabled to circumvent gravity thus you will be able to perform all manner of jugglery tricks tricks that will set the whole world gaping profit by them in the third stage you will possess the secrets of invisibility of walking on the water of breathing under the water of taming wild beasts and of understanding their language in the fourth stage you will understand how to inflict all manner of diseases and work all sorts of spells such for instance as bewitching milk causing people to have fits bad dreams etc you will also know how to create plagues plagues of insects or of any other noxious thing in the fifth stage you will possess absolute knowledge of the art of medicine and be able to cure every ailment in the sixth stage you will acquire the power of producing vampires and werewolves from the human being and of transforming people from the human to any animal guise in the seventh and final stage you will be given the complete mastery of every art and science including astrology astronomy necromancy etc and for this stage is reserved the greatest power of all namely the complete dominion over woman's will and affections the powers of creating life and of extending life beyond the now natural limit and of avoiding accidents will never be conferred on you neither shall you learn nor at least during your physical existence who or what we are or the secrets of creation each successive stage will cancel the preceding one that is to say the powers you have acquired in the first stage will be annulled on your arriving at the second stage and so on but if you carry out your compact faithfully that is to say if at the end of twenty-one months you are still united all the powers you have held hitherto in the different stages temporarily will return to you and remain in your possession permanently have you anything to say yes hamar answered i fully understand all you have explained to us and i like the idea of it immensely the fear of our coming to any serious loggerheads and of dissolving partnership doesn't worry me much but i must say it seems very remote the prospect of gaining such tremendous powers powers that will give us practically everything we want save youth youth you will never regain lisped the voice and elixirs of life surely you must know are no longer sought after by beings of the planet earth they are quite out of date 
you will of course learn the most efficacious means of making yourselves and other people youthful in appearance yes but how shall we learn these secrets kelson nerved himself to ask they will be revealed to you in various ways sometimes when asleep you will receive preliminary instructions as to divination before this time to-morrow and meanwhile we shall be in want of money curtis remarked no the voice replied you will not be in want of money have you anything more to ask no one spoke and the silence that followed was interrupted by a loud rustling of the wind the darkness then lifted but nothing was to be seen nothing save the trees and bushes moon and stars End of chapter 5 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 6 of The Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter 6 the first power after their rencontre with the unknown hamar and his companions did not get back to their respective quarters till the sun was high in the heavens and the streets of the city were beginning to vibrate with the rattle and clatter of traffic it's all very well this wonderful compact of ours curtis grumbled but i'm deuced hungry and matt and i haven't a cent between us as we went all that way last night to oblige you leon i think it is only fair that you should stand us treat i'll bet you have some nickels stowed away somewhere in those pockets of yours it wouldn't be you if you hadn't what do you say matt i think as you do kelson replied we've stood by leon he should stand by us how much have you leon how much have you curtis echoed come out with it no jew jewing pals for me i might manage a dollar hamar said ruefully as the prospect of a good meal all to himself at his favorite restaurant faded away where shall we go just then kelson happening to look behind him saw a young woman of prepossessing appearance ascending the steps of a dive in clay street he was instantly attracted as he always was attracted by a pretty woman and something a kind of intuition he had never had before told him that she was a waitress that she was discontented with her present situation that she was engaged to be married to a pen driver at hastings and hastings in sacramento street and that she had a mother of over seventy whom she kept all this came to kelson like a flash of lightning yielding to an impulse which he did not stay to analyze he gripped hamar and curtis each too astonished even to remonstrate by the arm and dragging them along with him followed the girl the dive had only just been opened and was being dusted and swept by two slatternly women with dago complexions and voices like hyenas it still reeked of stale drink and tobacco what's the good of coming to a place like this hamar demanded as soon as he had freed himself from kelson's clutches we can't get breakfast here matt's mad that's what's the matter with him curtis added in disgust let's get out he turned to go then halted and stood still he appeared to be listening what's up with you hamar asked both you fellows are behaving like lunatics this morning there's not a pin to choose between you they're playing cards that's all curtis said can't you hear them hamar shook his head not a sound he said just look at matt while the other two were talking kelson had followed the girl to the bar and catching her up just as she entered it said in a manner that was peculiar to him a manner seldom without effect upon girls of his class i beg your pardon miss are we too early to be served jerusalem haven't i met you somewhere before the girl looked him square in the eyes and then smiled as like as not she said i go pretty near everywhere what do you want well kelson soliloquized breakfast is what we are particularly anxious for but i suppose that is out of the question in a dive 
then why did you come here the girl queried because of you simply because of you kelson replied you hypnotized me that being so then i reckon you can have your breakfast the girl laughed though we don't provide them as a rule before nine indeed the management have only just decided this morning on providing them at all how odd why odd the girl questioned taking off her hat and arranging her curls before a mirror why that i should have happened to strike the right moment had i come here yesterday it would have been useless as i said you hypnotized me evidently fate intended us to meet do you believe in fate the girl asked shrugging her shoulders i believe in nothing least of all in men you say so kelson observed before he knew what he was saying and yet you have just got engaged to one but you've got a bad attack of the pip this morning you have had enough of it here you want to get another post the girl ceased doing her hair and eyed him in amazement well she said of all the queer men i've ever met you are the queerest are you a seer no hamar observed suddenly joining in he's only very hungry miss hungry body and soul hungry all over and so are we well then go into the room over there the girl cried pointing in the direction of a half-open door and breakfast will be brought you in half a jiffy who's that playing cards curtis asked how do you know anyone is playing cards the girl queried with an incredulous stare you can't see through walls can you no but i'm hanged if i can explain curtis said i seem to hear them there are two one is called arnold and the other lemon or some such name and they are rehearsing certain card tricks they mean to play to-night that's right the girl said two men named arnold and lemon are here they were playing all last night with two of the clerks in willow's bank in sacramento street and they cleared them out of every cent you knew it no i didn't curtis growled i don't lie for fun and i'm just as much in a fog as to how i know as you are let's have breakfast now and we'll look up these two gents afterwards if they haven't gone your friend's a brute i don't like him the girl whispered to kelson let him lose all he's got you stay out here nothing i should like better kelson said it's a bargain the breakfast was so good that they lingered long over it and the bar-room had a fair sprinkling of people when they re-entered it leaving kelson to chat with the girl hamar and curtis obeying her directions found their way to a small parlour in the rear of the building where two men were lolling over a card-table smoking and drinking and reading aloud extracts from a pink sporting paper it's a funny thing one of them exclaimed we can't be allowed to sit here in peace when there's so much spare space in the house we beg your pardon for intruding curtis said but my friend and i came in here for a quiet game of cards we're farmers down missouri way and don't often get the chance to run up to town farmers are you the man who had not yet spoken said eyeing them both closely you don't look it my friend lemon here and i were also wanting to have a game would you care to join us by all means curtis at once exclaimed what do you play poker the man said nap done but i'll show you something first which being fresh from the country you've probably never seen before though they do tell me people in missouri are mighty cute he then proceeded to show them what he called the bull and buffalo trick the secret of which he offered to sell them for ten dollars i wouldn't give you a cent for it curtis snapped anyone can see how it is done you can't the man retorted turning red i'll wager twenty dollars you can't curtis accepted the wager and at once did the trick he had seen through it at a glance there appeared no difficulty in it at all and yet he was quite certain if he had been asked to do it the day before he would have utterly failed now he said give me the money and the man complied with an oath any more tricks curtis asked complacently i know heaps the man rejoined there's one you won't guess the seven card trick he did it and so did curtis well i'm the man called lemon ejaculated he's the dandiest tobit tricks we've ever struck try him with the prince and slipper arnold arnold rather reluctantly assented and curtis burst out laughing why he said 
that's the simplest of all see and it was done you two had better come to an understanding with us or you'll not shine to-night how about a game of dawn lemon and arnold agreed but they had barely begun before curtis cried out it's no use lemon i can see those deuces up your sleeve you've some up yours too arnold the deuce of clubs and the deuce of hearts moreover you can tell our cards by notches and thumb smears on the back i'll show you how he told the cards correctly there was no gainsaying it the men were overwhelmed what are you anyway lemon asked tex never mind what we are curtis said savagely we know what you are and that's where the rub comes in now what are you going to pay us to hold our tongues pay you lemon hissed why damn you nothing we're not bankers all we've got to do is clear out and try somewhere else that might not be so easy as you imagine hamar interposed we would make it our business to have a scene first why not come to terms we'll not be over exorbitant and consider the convenience of not having to shift your quarters well of all the blooming frosts i've struck none beats this lemon said fancy being pipped by a couple of suckers like these farmers indeed why don't you call yourselves parsons how much do you want after a prolonged haggling hamar and curtis agreed to take fifty dollars and considering their penniless condition they were by no means dissatisfied with their bargain they were now ready to go and looking round for kelson found him engaged in a desperate tete-a-tete -tete with the young lady at the bar who despite her avowed lack of faith in mankind counted half the room her friends she promised kelson that she would meet him at eight o'clock that evening but as both she and he were quite used to making such promises and subsequently forgetting all about them their rencontre resulted only in one thing namely in furnishing the three allies with the nucleus of the big fortune they intended making on finding themselves outside the dive hamar curtis and kelson first of all divided the spoil then they went to a clothes depot and rigged themselves out in fashionably cut garments after which they took rooms at a presentable hotel in kearney street next door to nobbles boot store then dressed for the first time in their lives like knob hill dukes they paraded the pet resorts of the beaumont of the bonanza and railroad set and making eyes at all the pretty wives and daughters they met cogitated fresh devices for making money as they sauntered across pacific avenue in the direction of californian street kelson suddenly gave vent to a whistle what the deuce is wrong with you hamar exclaimed seen your grandmother's ghost no but i've seen the inner readings of that lady yonder kelson replied indicating with a jerk of his finger a fashionably dressed woman walking towards them on the other side of the road the deuce knows how it all comes to me but i know everything about her just the same as i did with the girl on the dive though i've never seen her before she is the wife of d d belton the cotton magnet who lives in a big white house at the corner of powell street and a beauty i can assure you supposed to be most devoted to her husband she is now on her way to keep an appointment with the rev j t calthorpe of sancta maria's church in appleyard street with whom she has been holding clandestine meetings for the past six months whew hammer ejaculated you speak as if it was all being pumped into you by some external agency automatically that's just about what i feel kelson said i feel as if it were someone else saying all this someone else speaking through me yet i know all about that woman just as much as if i had been acquainted with her all my life it's the first power hamar said excitedly the power of divination it takes that form with you and the form of card tricks with ed with me nothing so far but what shall i do kelson cried how can i benefit by it how can't you curtis growled why blackmail her if it is true she will pay you anything to keep your mouth shut if once you can tell a woman's secret your future's made all san francisco will be at your mercy god knows who'll escape after her at once you idiot now kelson gasped yes now follow her to calthorpe's and waylay her as she comes out you can refer to us as witnesses i feel a bit of a blackguard kelson pleaded you look it anyway 
curtis grinned but cheer up it's the clothes clothes are responsible for everything after a little persuasion kelson gave in but he had to make haste as the lady was nearly out of sight she took a taxi from the stand opposite kitson's hotel and kelson took one too two hours later raising his hat he accosted her as she stood tapping the pavement of battery street with a daintily shod foot waiting to cross mrs belton i think he said the lady eyed him coldly well she said what do you want who are you my name can scarcely matter to you kelson responded though my business may i have been engaged to watch you and am fully posted as to your meetings and correspondence with the rev j t calthorpe i don't understand you the lady said her cheeks flaming you have made a mistake a very serious mistake for you for a moment kelson's heart failed he was still a clerk with all the humility of an office stool and shining trousers seat thick on him whilst she was a grand dame accustomed to the bows and scrapes of employers as well as employed several people passed by and stared at him as he thought suspiciously and he felt that this was the most critical time in his life and unless he pulled through smartly in fact he would be done once and for all if he didn't make haste too the woman would undoubtedly call a policeman it was this thought as well as though perhaps hardly as much as the look of her that stimulated kelson to action he hated behaving badly to women but was this thing dressed in a skirt that fitted like a glove and showed up every detail of her figure this thing with the paint on her cheeks and eyebrows and lips artistically done perhaps but done all the same this thing all loaded with jewelry and buttons this thing a woman no she was not she was only a millionaire's plaything brainless heartless a hobby that cost thousands whilst countless men such as he starved he detested abominated such luxuries and thus nerved he retorted borrowing some of her imperiousness do you deny madam that for the past two hours you've been sitting on the sofa of the end room of the third floor of number two sixteen market street flirting with the reverend j t calthorpe whom you call mickey moo that you gave him a photo you had taken at bell's studio in clay street specially for him that you gave him five greenbacks to the value of one hundred and fifty dollars and that you've planned a moonlight promenade with him to-morrow when your husband will be in denver don't talk so loud the lady said in a low voice walk along with me a little and then we shan't be noticed i see you do know a good deal how i can't imagine unless you were hidden somewhere in the room who has employed you to watch me that madam i can't say kelson truthfully responded and i can't think the lady said unless it is some woman enemy but after all you can't do much since you hold no proofs your word alone will count for nothing ah but i have strong corroborative evidence kelson retorted i have the testimony of at least two other people who know quite as much as i do adventurers like yourself the lady sneered my husband would never believe you nor your friends he would believe your letters anyway said kelson my letters the lady laughed you've no letters of mine no but i know where the correspondence that has passed between you and the rev j t calthorpe is to be found he has sixty-nine letters from you all tied up in pink ribbon locked up in the bottom drawer of the bureau in his study at the vicarage some of the letters begin with dearest duckiest handsomest herbie short for herbert and others fondest blondest darlingest mickey moo some end with a thousand and one kisses from your loving and ever devoted francesca and others with love and kisses ad infinitum ever your loving thirsting adoring one tootsie nice letters from the wife of a respectable knob hill magnet to a married clergyman the lady walked a trifle unsteadily and much of her colour was gone i can't understand it she panted someone has played me false as the rev j t calthorpe is on his way to sacramento where he has to remain till to-morrow kelson went on pitilessly it will be the easiest thing in the world to get those letters i have merely to call at the house and tell his wife and what good will that do you the lady asked revenge i hate the rich kelson said i would do anything to injure them 
you are a socialist an anarchist but come you see i know all about you and that i have you completely in my power if once either your husband or mrs calthorpe gets a hold of those letters you and your lover would have a very unpleasant time of it you're a devil maybe i am at all events i'm talking to one that's neither here nor there i want money give me a thousand dollars and you'll never hear from me again blackmail i could have you arrested yes and i would tell the court the whole story of your intrigues that wouldn't help you and kelson laughed could i count on you not molesting me again if i were to pay you the lady said mockingly you could do you ever speak the truth you needn't judge every one by your own standard of morality the standard set up by the millionaire's wife kelson said i swear that if you pay me a thousand dollars i will never trouble you again the lady grew thoughtful and for some minutes neither of them spoke then she suddenly jerked out i think after all i'll accept your proposal wait outside here and you shall have what you want within an hour not good enough kelson said i prefer to come with you to your house and wait there the lady protested and kelson consented to wait in the street outside her house where eventually she delivered the money into his hands i've kept my word she said and if you're half a man you'll keep yours kelson reassured her and more than pleased with himself made for the hotel where the three of them were now stopping this was merely a beginning before the day was out he had secured two more victims no woman whose character was not without blemish was safe from him his wonderful newly acquired gift enabling him to detect any vice no matter how snugly hidden and this wonderful power of discernment brought with it an expression of mystery and penetration which by enhancing the effect of the power made the application of it comparatively easy kelson had only to glide after his victim and with his eyes fixed searchingly on her to say madam may i have a word with you and the battle was more than half won the women were too fascinated to think of resistance for example shortly after his initial adventure he saw a very smartly dressed woman in van ness avenue peep about furtively and then stop to speak to a little child who was walking with its nurse divination at once told him everything the lady was the mother of the child but its father was not her legitimate husband w s hobson the millionaire mine owner when kelson courteously informed her he was in possession of her secret a secret she had felt positively certain only one other person knew she went the colour of her pea-green sunshade and attempted to remonstrate but kelson's appearance no less than his marvellous knowledge of her life and character dumbfounded her she was simply paralysed into admission and before he left her kelson had added another thousand dollars to his hoard that evening close to the academy of science in market street he saw a lady get out of a taxi and quickly enter a pawnbroker's her whole life at once rose up before him she was ella crockford the wife of the californian street sugar king and unknown to her husband she spent her afternoons at a gambling saloon in kearney street where she ran through thousands she was now about to pledge her husband's latest present to her a diamond tiara one of the most notable pieces of jewellery in the country in the hope that she would soon win back sufficient money at cards to redeem it kelson stopped her as she came out and in a marvellously few words proved to her he knew everything her amazement was beyond description you must be a magician she said because i'm certain no one saw me take my jewel case out of the drawer no one was in the room and as i put it in my muff immediately no one could have seen it as i left the house besides i never told a soul i intended pawning it so how is it possible you could know and be able to repeat the whole of the conversation i had with walter legrand to whom i lost so heavily last night tell me how do you know all this but kelson would tell her nothing nothing beyond her own sins and misfortunes i have nothing to give you she told him i dare not ask my husband for more money what nothing kelson replied when the pawnbroker has just advanced you fifty thousand dollars you call that nothing be pleased to give me one thousand and congratulate yourself that i do not ask for all your nothing 
and as neither tears nor prayers had any effect she was obliged to pay him the sum he asked flushed and excited with victory and thinking perhaps that he had done enough for one day kelson took his spoils to a bank near the palace hotel and for the first time in his career opened a banking account as he was leaving the building he ran into hamar bent on a similar errand the two gleefully compared notes i thought hamar said my turn would never come and that i must have done something to get out of favour with the unknown but as i was sitting in the pig and whistle saloon in corn street drinking a lager i suddenly felt a peculiar throbbing sensation run up my left leg into my left hand and the floor seemed to open up and i saw deep below me in a black pit a skeleton clutching hold of a linen bag full of coins i could see the gold quite distinctly spanish doubles none newer than the eighteenth century i knew then that the unknown had not forgotten me look here boss i said to old man moss the proprietor you know you're a bit of a juggins to go on working with so much money under here and i pointed to the floor i'm surprised at you hamar moss said cocking an eye at me and logger too no old man i said i'm not drunk i'm sober and serious you've got a cellar below here haven't you well and what if i have moss retorted drawing a step closer and running his eyes carefully over me what if i have there's no harm in that is there you keep all your stock down there i went on and more beside i can see a hat pin with a gold knob that's not your wife's and a pair of shoes with dandy silver buckles that's not intended for your wife no how at that moss made a queer noise in his throat and i thought he was going to have a fit what what the devil are you talking about he gurgled i wish i had had you with me then matt for you could have doubtless summed up the woman to him she was a blank to me i only divined one had been there yes mr mossy i said you're a gay deceiver and no mistake i know all about it do you he said eyeing me excitedly do you know all about it i am not so sure but in order to avoid running any risks drop your voice a bit and have a cocktail with me he poured me out one and i went on softly well boss moss i said we'll leave the female out of the question for the present underneath this cellar of yours is a pit i'm damned if there is moss snorted leastways it's the first i've ever heard of it and in this pit i said is the skeleton of a spanish buccaneer called don guzman who landed in this port on august tenth sixteen ninety nine and after robbing and slicing up a family of the name of ervada who lived on the site of what is now the copthorn hotel was hurrying off with all their money and jewels when he fell into a pit covered with brambles and briars and broke his neck and you expect me to believe this cock-and-bull story moss growled being out of a job so long has made you balmy it hasn't made me too balmy not to see through the way you deceive your wife moss i said i'll bet she would think me sane enough if i were to tell her all i know but i'll spare you if you will take me into your cellar and help me do a bit of excavation there but promise mind you that we will go shares in what we find oh i'll promise right enough moss replied i'll promise anything if only to keep you from talking such moonshine well in the end i prevailed upon him to accompany me and we went into the cellar just as i had depicted it armed with a pickaxe and crowbar moss growling and jeering every step he took and i deadly in earnest it's under there i said halting over a flagstone in the corner of the vault but before we do anything you had better hide that hat pin and those shoes or your missus will find them she'll hear us scraping and come to see what's up moss who was in a vile temper all the time made a grab at the things pricking his finger and swearing horribly in the meanwhile i had set to work and with his aid raised the stone we dug for pretty nearly an hour moss calling upon me all the time to chuck it when i suddenly struck something hard it was the skeleton and close beside it was the bag you should have seen moss then he was simply overcome called me a wizard a magician and heaven alone knows what and fairly stood on his head with delight when we opened the bag and hundreds of gold coins and precious stones rolled out on the floor he wanted to go back on his word then and only give me a handful but i was too smart for him and swore that i would tell his wife about the girl unless he gave me half 
when we were leaving the cellar of course he wanted me to go first so that he could follow me with the pickaxe but here again i was too sharp for him and i got safely out of the place with my pockets bulging i went right away to prescott's in clay street and let the lot go for three thousand dollars i wonder how curtis has got on they walked together to the hotel and found curtis busily engaged eating i've worked hard he said and now i'm in for enjoying myself i've made them get out a special menu for me and i'm going to eat till i can't hold another morsel i've starved all my life and now i intend making up for it been successful hamar asked winking at kelson pretty well nothing to grumble at curtis rejoined pouring himself out a glass of champagne first of all i went to simpson's dive in sacramento street and started doing the tricks we discovered yesterday not a soul in the place could see through them and i made about two hundred dollars before i left i then had lunch why you had lunch with us hamar laughed well can't i have as many lunches as i like curtis replied i had lunch i say at a place in market street and there i read in a paper that peters and purvis the tin food people were offering a prize of three thousand dollars for a solution to a puzzle contained on the inside cover of one of their tins i immediately determined to enter for it i bought a tin and saw through the puzzle at once bribing a policeman to go with me to see fair play off i set to peters and purvis i want to see your boss i said to the first clerk i saw which of them the clerk grunted his cheeks turning white at the sight of the policeman either will do i replied peters or purvis trot him up time is precious away he went but in a couple of minutes he was back again looking scared they're both engaged he says then they'll have to break it off i responded and mighty quick i'm here to talk with him so get a move on again and give that message if it hadn't been for the policeman i don't think he would have gone but the policeman backed me up and the clerk hurried off again and in the end the bosses decided they had better see me they looked precious cross i can assure you but before i had done speaking they looked crosser still you say you've done that puzzle they shouted the puzzle that has stuck all the mathematical guns at harvard and yale you a nonentity like you begone sir don't waste our time with such humbug as that all right i said give me some paper and a pen and i'll prove it that's very reasonable the policeman chipped in do the thing fair and square i'm here as a witness well with much grunting and grumbling they handed me paper and ink and in a trice the puzzle was done and it appeared so easy that the policeman clapped his hands and broke out into a loud guffaw my eyes you should have seen how the faces of purvis and peters fell and have heard what they said but it was no use swearing and cursing the thing was done and there was the policeman to prove it we'll give you five hundred dollars they said to clear out and say no more about it five hundred dollars when you've advertised three thousand i cried what do you take me for i'll have that three thousand or i'll show you both up a thousand then they said no i retorted three three and look sharp and look here i added as my glance rested on some of the samples of their paste they had round them i understand the secrets of all these so-called patents of yours there isn't one of them i couldn't imitate take that rabsadab for instance what is it why a compound of horseflesh turnips and popcorn flavored with lazenby sauce for the infringement of which patent you are liable to prosecution and colored with cochineal and there's the stuff you label iron caster but they shut me up there take your three thousand dollars write us out a receipt for it and clear nine thousand dollars in one day we've done well kelson ejaculated what's the program for tomorrow same as today and plenty of it curtis said pouring himself out another glass of champagne and making a vigorous attack on a chicken i think i'll let you two fellows do all the work tomorrow and content myself here waiter what time's breakfast end of chapter six read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california Chapter Seven of the Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Seven: San Francisco Ladies and Divination. 
Curtis was as good as his word. The following day he remained indoors eating and planning what he should eat, whilst Hamar and Kelson went out with the express purpose of adding to their banking accounts. In a garden in Bryant Street, Hamar saw a man resting on his spade and mopping the perspiration from his forehead. As he stopped mechanically to see what was being done, a cold sensation ran up his right leg into his right hand, the first and third fingers of which were drawn violently down. With a cry of horror, he shrank back. Directly beneath where he had been standing, he saw, under a fifteen or sixteen feet layer of gravel soil, water a huge cauldron of water black and silent water that gave him the impression of tremendous depth and coldness hello matey what's the matter the man with the spade called out are you looking for your skin i never saw anyone so completely jump out of it so would you hamar said with a shudder if you saw what i do what's that then the man said leering on the ground snakes that's what i always see when i've got em so long as you don't see yourself there's some chance for you hamar retorted what makes you so hot why digging the man laughed any one would get hot digging at such hard ground as this as for a little whippersnapper like you you'd melt right away and only your nose would remain nothing would ever melt that there's too much of it hamar scowled you needn't be insulting he said i asked you a simple question and i repeat it what makes you so hot when you should be cold or at least cool oh should i the man mimicked i thought first you was merely drunk i can see quite clearly now that you're mad and yet you have such defective sight what makes you say that the man said testily why hamar responded because you can't see what lies beneath your very nose shall i tell you what it is yes tell away the man replied tell me my old mother's got twins and that boss croker is coming to lodge with us i'd know you for a liar anywhere by those teeth of yours look here said hamar drawing himself up angrily i have had enough of your abuse if i have any more i'll tell your employers it is evident you take me for a bummer but see and plunging his hand in his pocket he pulled it out full of gold kindly understand i'm somebody he went on and that i'm staying at one of the biggest hotels in the town i'm damned if i know what to make of you the man muttered unless you're a hoptical delusion underneath where i was standing just here and hamar indicated the spot is water any amount of it you have only to sink a shaft fifteen feet and you would come to it water the man laughed yes there is any amount of it on your brain that's the only water near here then you don't believe me hamar demanded not likely the man responded i only believe what i see and when i see a face like yours holding out a pot full of dollars i know as how you've stolen em Get and hamar flew but hamar was not so easily nonplussed not at least when he saw a chance of making money entering the garden and keeping well out of sight of the gardener he arrived at the front door by a side path and with much formality requested to see the owner of the establishment the latter happening to be crossing the hall at the time heard hamar and asked what he wanted hamar at once informed him he was a dowser and that chancing to pass by the garden on his way to his hotel he had divined the presence of water i only wish there were the gentleman exclaimed but i fear you are mistaken i have attempted several times to sink a well but never with the slightest degree of success i have had all the ground carefully prospected by figgins of sacramento street he has a very big reputation and he assures me there isn't a drop of water anywhere near here within two hundred feet of the surface i know better hamar said will you get your gardener who by the way was very rude to me just now when i spoke to him to dig where i tell him i have absolute confidence in my power of divination the owner of the property 
whom i will call mr b assented and several gardeners including the one who had so insulted hamar were soon digging vigorously at the depth of fifteen feet water was found and indeed so fast did it begin to come that within a few minutes it had risen a foot the onlookers were jubilant i will send an account of it to the local papers mr b remarked your fame will be spread everywhere you have increased the value of my property a thousandfold i cannot tell you how grateful i am and he then and there invited hamar to luncheon after luncheon mr b made a present of a cheque rather in excess of the sum which hamar had all along intended to have and could not have refrained from demanding much longer in the afternoon all the san francisco specials were full of the incident and hamar seeing his name placarded for the first time was so overcome that he spent the rest of the evening in the hotel deliberating how he could best turn his sudden notoriety to account at ten o'clock kelson came in looking somewhat fatigued but nevertheless pleased he too had had adventures and he detailed them with so much elaboration that the other two had frequently to tell him to dry up i began in the morning he commenced by accosting a very fashionably dressed lady coming out of bushwell's store in commercial street divination at once told me she was the popular widow of j k bader the biscuit king of knob hill and that she was carrying in her big sealskin muff a gold hat-pin mounted with an emerald butterfly a silver-backed hairbrush a blue enameled scent bottle and a porcelain jar all of which she had slyly nicked when no one was looking i stepped up to her and politely raised my hat saying good morning mrs bater i've a message for you i don't know you she said eyeing me very doubtfully who are you forgotten i said tragically and i have flattered myself it would be otherwise still i must try and survive i want to ask you a favour mrs bater a favour she exclaimed nervously what is it you are really a very extraordinary individual i was only going to ask if i might examine the contents of your muff i think you have certain articles in it that have not been paid for and i believe i am right in saying this is by no means the first time such a thing has happened she turned so pale i thought she was going to faint why whatever do you mean she stammered i've nothing that does not belong to me opinions differ on that score mrs bater i replied you have a pin a hairbrush a scent bottle and a jar and i described them each minutely whilst in your house you have on your dressing-table a silver-backed clothes-brush a silver manicure set you kleptomaniaed if you prefer to call it so from deacon's in sacramento street a tortoise-shell manicure set and an ivory card-case you obtained in the same manner from varter's in market street a set of silver buttons a glove stretcher and a mauve pincushion you likewise helped yourself too from selters in kearney street but i might go on detailing them to you till further orders for your house is literally crammed with them you have done very well mrs bater with the san francisco storekeepers good god man what are you she gasped you seem to read into the innermost recesses of my soul and to know everything you are right madam i said trying to appear very stern and almost failing she was so pretty by jove you fellows i wonder i didn't kiss her she had such fine eyes my favourite nose a ripping mouth and oh go on go on with your story never mind her looks curtis interrupted i've got a touch of indigestion as i was saying kelson went on complacently i could have kissed her and i felt downright mean for upsetting her so now that you have found me out she said what do you intend doing show me up in there and she pointed shudderingly at the store no i said not if you are sensible and come to terms i will agree to say nothing about either this or any of your other <clears throat> thefts if you let me escort you home and write me out a cheque for a thousand dollars beast she hissed so you are a blackmailer a black beetle if you like i responded but i assure you mrs bater i am letting you off cheap i have only to call for a policeman and your reputation would be gone at once besides i know other things about you what other things she stuttered well madam i replied 
some things are rather delicate er for single men like me to mention but i do know that er a lady very like remarkably like you has in her pocket at this moment a rattle which she bought and paid for in oakland's late last night and as madam mr bader has been dead over two years let me see yes two years yesterday one can stay that will do she whispered come to my house and i will give you the thousand dollars you must pretend you are my cousin i will pretend anything mrs bader i murmured helping her into a taxi anything so long as i can be with you you got the money hamar queried yes kelson said with a smile i got the money in fact everything i asked for there was a silence for some minutes and then hamar said what next what next kelson said why i thought i had done a very good day's work and was on my way back here to take a much-needed rest when i'm dashed if the unknown hadn't another adventure in store for me coming out of a garden in gough street within sight of goad's house was a lady young and very plain but rigged out in one of those latest fashion costumes a very tight short skirt and huge hat with high plume in it by the by i can't think why this costume which is so admirably suited to pretty girls because it attracts attention to them should be almost exclusively adopted by the ugly ones but to continue i knew immediately that she was ella barlow the much pampered and only daughter of j b barlow the vinegar magnet that she was in love or imagined herself in love with herbert delmas the manager of the columbian bank a young good-looking fellow whom she had been trying to set against his fiancée dora roberts dora is only nineteen very pretty and a trifle giddy nothing more but this failing of hers if you can call it a failing was just the very weapon ella barlow wanted she worked on it at once and by sending delmas a series of anonymous letters made him mad with jealousy this resulted in a breach between delmas and dora and ella barlow much elated at once tried to step into her shoes she has been going out a good deal with delmas who is in reality still very much in love with dora and consequently exceedingly miserable this morning ella anxious to show off a magnificent set of diamonds given her by her father telephoned to delmas to take her to the baldwin theatre where she has engaged a box for this evening fondly hoping that the diamonds will bring him up to the scratch and that he will propose to her when i saw her she was on her way to a notorious quack doctor and beauty specialist in californian street she suffers from some nasty skin disease and is in mortal terror lest delmas should get to know of it and also the fact that all her teeth are false and that two of her toes are badly deformed by jupiter hamar ejaculated this divination of yours beats mine into fits nothing escapes you no kelson laughed nothing ella barlow metaphysical and physical was laid before me just as bare as if the almighty had got hold of her with his dissecting knife i saw everything and what is more i said to myself here's plenty i can turn to a profitable account well i didn't stop her i let her go let her go curtis growled his mouth full of almonds and raisins you squirrel only for a time kelson said i went to see delmas delmas hamar interlocuted why the deuce delmas impulse kelson explained purely impulse yes but impulse is often a dangerous thing hamar said it is essential for us three especially to be on our guard against impulse what did you get out of delmas nothing kelson said looking rather shamefaced but the matter hasn't ended yet i'm going to the theatre after i've had something to eat i'll tell you what happens to-morrow it was late ere kelson came down to breakfast the following day and hamar and curtis were comfortably seated in armchairs reading the examiner when he joined them well hamar said looking up at him what luck but kelson wouldn't say a word till he had finished eating he then lolled back in his seat and began arriving at the baldwin i went straight to box one a tall figure rose to greet me and then an angry voice exclaimed why it's not herbert who are you sir do you know this box is engaged i humbly beg your pardon miss barlow i said 
i do know it is engaged but i came as mr delmas deputy and friend came as herbert's deputy and friend ella barlow repeated and by jove the diamonds did shine she was simply a mass of them hair neck arms and fingers and she had been so well faked up for the occasion that she was almost good-looking but i thought of all i knew about her and shuddered i will explain myself i said mr delmas telephoned to you this afternoon did he not she nodded saying that he very much regretted he could not leave business in time to escort you here would you mind very much going by yourself and he would join you as soon as possible yes ella barlow said he told me all that very well then i went on he rang me up some minutes later and asked me if i would take his place for the first hour or so and he would be here by the end of the first act but it is most unheard of ella barlow ejaculated i don't know you i've never seen you before that is of course very regrettable i said but i will do all i can for the past i've something to say that i'm sure will interest you have i your permission and without waiting for her reply i sat next to her the box was a big one big enough to hold half a dozen people and we sat in the extreme front of it the lights were not full up as the orchestra had not started playing i kept her attention fixed on my face so that she was unaware what was taking place immediately behind her what is it she said whatever can you have to say that can be of any possible interest to me why i replied to begin with i know something about your character then you're a fortune teller she exclaimed eagerly i can read everything i said looking hard at her hands head and feet i am a psychometrist dentist physician metaphysician all in one i don't understand she said looking queer what is the meaning of all this it means i said slowly that i have discovered who sent those anonymous letters to herbert delmas anonymous letters how dare you she cried what have anonymous letters to do with me a very great deal madam i replied i shall remind you of their contents and the occasions on which you wrote them i did so i recited every word in them and told her the hour day and place namely when and where each was written and i summed up by asking what she would pay me not to tell delmas for some minutes she was too overcome to say anything she sat grim and silent her pale eyes glaring at me her freckled fingers toying with the diamonds she was baffled and perplexed she did not know what course to pursue well i repeated what have you to say do you deny it she roused herself with an effort no she said venomously i don't deny it denial would be useless how did you find out through one of the maids i suppose they were bribed to spy on me how i discovered it is of no consequence i said but what is of consequence to you as much as to me is the payment for hushing it up payment she cried raising her voice to a positive shriek in her excitement pay you you nasty beastly cadging toad you but i can't repeat all she said it would make you both blush i let her go on until she had worn herself out and then i said well miss barlow why all this fuss why these fireworks it can't do you any good we must come to business sooner or later if you don't pay me handsomely i shall tell miss roberts as well as mr delmas mr delmas won't believe you she hissed you've no proofs at all perhaps not i said but i've proofs of this i know you have two deformed toes on your left foot that all your teeth are false and that you go to that charlatan howard prince in californian street to be faked up i must be brutal it's no use being anything else to women of your sort you've got a certain species of eczema and you flatter yourself that no one but you and prince are aware of it what have you to say now miss barlow but ella barlow had fainted when she came to which i managed after vigorous applications of salts and water the effect of the latter on her complexion i leave you to imagine i again broached the subject what is it you propose she said feebly why this i said you hand me over all those diamonds and your defects as far as i am concerned will always remain a secret refuse and miss roberts and mr delmas shall know all there is to be known at once for some minutes she sat with her face buried in her hands shivering 
then she looked up at me and jerusalem it was like looking at an old woman take them she said take them i shall never wear them again anyhow take them and leave me well you fellows i steeled my heart and slipped every jack one that was on her into my pocket you won't tell them she whispered catching hold of me by the arm you swear you won't i won't try and remember exactly what i answered but outside the door of the box delmas joined me he had been concealed within and had heard everything that passed i can't say how grateful i am to you he said it's a bit low down perhaps but then we were dealing with a low down person you thoroughly deserve those diamonds will you accept an offer for them from me i should like to buy them for miss roberts and present them to her on our reconciliation we came to terms then and there and he phoned through to me an hour ago to say that he had made it up with miss roberts and that she was delighted with the diamonds and that they are going to be married next month so out of evil good comes hamar said the maxim for us remember is out of evil evil alone must come what are you going to do to-day you two rest said kelson i'm tired eat said curtis i'm hungry now look here this won't do hamar remarked you've earned your rest matt but you haven't ed you can't go on eating eternally can't i curtis snapped i'm not so sure of that i've had years to make up for then do the thing in moderation for goodness sake hamar expostulated and recollect we must at all costs act together we now have twelve thousand dollars between us in the bank that is to say the capital of the firm of hamar curtis and kelson represents that amount it is our ambition to increase that amount and to go on increasing it till we can fairly claim it to be the richest firm in the world now to do that we must work and work hard if we are to live at the pace ed is setting us there is no reason why we should remain here and i propose that we move elsewhere i've got a scheme in my head rather a colossal one i admit but not altogether impossible what is it kelson asked yes out with it curtis grunted it is this hamar said i suggest that we go to london london in england i guess it's the richest town in the world and they're set up as sorcerers the sorcery company limited we should begin with divination and juggling and so on according to the seven stages we should of course sell our cures and spells and there is not the slightest doubt but that we should make an enormous pile with which we would gradually buy up not merely london but the whole of england that's a rather tall order kelson murmured a small one you mean curtis sneered you could put the whole of england twice over in california and from what i've heard i don't go much on london i reckon it isn't much bigger than san francisco still you wouldn't mind being joint owner of it hamar laughed no perhaps not curtis said rather dubiously i guess we could buy the crown and wear it in turn sam westlake up at medler's always used to say the britishers will sell their souls if any one bid high enough they think of nothing but money over there when shall we go at the end of the week hamar said that is to say on wednesday in three days time first class all the way of course curtis said i'll see to the arrangements for the catering and berths all right hamar laughed as he filled three glasses with champagne here drink you fellows long life health and prosperity to hamar curtis and kelson the modern sorcery company limited end of chapter seven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter eight of the sorcery club by elliot o'donnell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter eight two dreams do you believe in dreams gladys martin inquired as fresh from a stroll in the garden she joined her aunt miss templeton in the breakfast room at pine cottage i believe in fairies miss templeton rejoined smiling indulgently as she looked at the fair face beside her what was the dream dearie 
gladys laughed a little mischievously i don't quite know whether i ought to tell you she said it might shock you perhaps i'm not so easily shocked as you imagine miss templeton replied what was it well gladys began flinging both arms round her aunt's neck and playing with the pleats in her blouse i dreamed that i was walking in the little wood at the end of the garden and that the trees and flowers walked and talked with me and we danced together and first of all i had for my partner a red rose and then an ash they both made love to me and squeezed my waist with their hot fibrous hands a poppy piped a bramble played the concertina and a lilac grew desperately jealous of me and tried to claw my hair then the dancing ceased and i found myself in the midst of bluebells that shook their bells at me with loud trills of laughter and out from among them came a buttercup pointing its yellow head at me see see it cried what gladys is carrying behind her naughty gladys and the trees and flowers everything around me shook with laughter then i grew hot and cold all over and did not know which way to look for my confusion till a willow having compassion on me said take no notice of them they don't know any better i begged him to explain to me why they were so amused and he grew very embarrassed and uncomfortable and stammered oh so funnily well if you really wish to know it's a bud a baby white rose and it's clinging to your dress a baby a baby rose shrieked all the flowers and it means a bluebell said stepping perkily out from amidst its fellows that your lover is coming your lover with a tra -le la la and well if you want to know more ask the gooseberries and the gooseberries that hang on the bushes or the parsley that grows in the bed and at that all the flowers and trees shrieked with laughter ta ta tra la la and with my ears full of the rude laughter of the wood i awoke what do you think of it isn't it a rather quaint mixture of the of the sacred at least the artistic and the profane quite so said miss templeton with an amused chuckle but i shouldn't ask for an interpretation of it if i were you not for an interpretation of the trees and flowers gladys asked innocently i'm sure trees and flowers have a special significance in dreams very well then my dear ask mrs spratt what ask the vicar's wife gladys ejaculated when i never go to church certainly miss templeton replied laughing again mrs spratt will quite understand and i've always been told she is very interested in anything to do with the occult but hush here's your father you'd better not tell him your dream he's tired to death he says of hearing about your lovers and agrees with me there's no end to them never mind what he says his bark's worse than his bite gladys rejoined he doesn't really care how many i have so long as they keep within bounds and i like them father john martin who entered the room at that moment went straight to his daughter to be kissed i wish you wouldn't always select that bald spot he said testily i don't like to be everlastingly reminded i'm losing my hair where do you want me to kiss you then gladys argued on the tip of your nose that's all very well for you john martin but i prefer the top of your head but the poor dear looks worried what is it i didn't have a very good night her father replied i dreamed a lot gladys looked at miss templeton and laughed did you she said gently what a shame i never dream what was it all about flowers john martin snapped idiotic flowers roses lilac tulips bah i do wish you would have some other hobby gladys looked at her aunt again this time with a half serious half questioning expression shall i be a politician she cooed and fill the house with suffragettes you bad man i believe you would revel in it don't you think so auntie i think instead of teasing your father so unmercifully you had better pour him out a cup of tea miss templeton replied jack there's a letter for you or under my plate what a place to put it 
that's you and john martin frowned or rather attempted to frown at gladys why it's about davenport dick davenport he's very ill had a stroke yesterday and the doctor declares his condition critical his nephew shiel so anne says has been sent for and arrived at sydenham last night if that's not bad news i don't know what is john martin said thrusting his plate away from him and leaning back in his chair it's true i can manage the business all right myself and there's the possibility of course that this young shiel may shape all right i suppose if anything happens he will step into dick's shoes i've never heard dick mention any one else poor old dick i am so sorry father gladys said laying her hand on his but cheer up he may not be as bad as you expect shall you go and see how he is i think so my dear i think so john martin replied but don't worry me about it now talk to your aunt and leave me out of it i'm a bit upset my brain's in a regular whirl undoubtedly the news was something in the nature of a blow for dick davenport apart from being john martin's partner partner in the firm of martin and davenport the world-renowned conjurers whose hall in the kingsway was one of the chief amusement places in london was john martin's oldest friend they had been chums at cheltenham college and entered the army and gone to india together had quitted the service together and on returning together to england had started their conjuring business first of all in sloane street and subsequently in the kingsway from the very start their enterprise had met with success and had it not been for davenport's wild extravagance they would have been little short of millionaires but davenport though a most lovable character in every respect could not keep money he no sooner had it than it was gone his house in sydenham was little short of a palace whilst it was said he almost rivalled royalty in magnificent display whenever he entertained the result of all this reckless expenditure was no uncommon one he ran through considerably more than he earned and as there was no one else to help him he invariably came down on john martin it was jack old boy i'm damned sorry but i must have another thousand or jack these infernal scamps of creditors are worrying the life out of me can you will you lend me a trifle a couple of thousand will do it and so on so on ad infinitum john martin never refused and at the time of davenport's illness the latter owed him something like a hundred thousand pounds fortunately john martin though far from parsimonious was careful he had an excellent business head and thanks to his sagacious share in the management the business remained solvent he knew davenport's capacity that nowhere could he have found another such a brilliant genius in conjuring nor apart from his thriftlessness any one so thoroughly reliable in davenport's keeping all the great tricks they had invented and great tricks they undoubtedly were were absolutely safe despite the fact that they had repeatedly offered big sums of money to any one who could discover the secret of how they were done every attempt to do so had utterly failed the mysteries of martin and davenport's home of wonder in the kingsway baffled the world of course one thing had helped them enormously namely they had no rivals so colossal was their reputation that no one else had ever even thought of setting up in opposition and now one of the two great master minds that had accomplished all these marvels and acquired such universal fame was stricken down checkmated by the still greater power of nature and his colleague the only other man in existence who shared his knowledge was obliged to rack his brain as to what was now to be done done for the continuance and prosperity of the firm after finishing her breakfast gladys joined her aunt in the garden to dream of flowers and trees evidently means bad news she said but as i feel in a mood for a walk i shall call at the vicarage what now at this hour miss templeton cried aghast why not gladys said imperturbably i'm not going to pay a call they haven't called on us i shall say i've merely come to make an inquiry can she tell me of any one who interprets dreams come with me 
but as her aunt pleaded an excuse gladys went alone the vicar was in the garden in his shirt-sleeves and though obviously surprised to see gladys seemed quite prepared to enter into conversation with her but gladys was not enamoured of clergymen her ways were not their ways and she had come strictly on business consequently she somewhat curtly demanded to be conducted into the presence of his wife who received her very affably why how very strange she observed when gladys had stated the object of her visit i was asked a similar question only yesterday a miss rosenberg who is staying with us had an extraordinary dream about trees and flowers only it took the form of a poem which she awoke repeating there were several verses quite doggerel it is true but nevertheless rather remarkable for a dream she wrote them down and asked me if i could tell her whether there was any hidden meaning in them here they are she handed gladys two pages of sermon paper on which was written in the greenest of green valleys a glow with summer sun lived a maiden fair and radiant more radiant there was none the flowers gave her their friendship her couch was on the ground a happier gayer maiden was nowhere to be found the air was filled with music sung by the babbling brook sweet lullabies with chorus clear in which the flowers partook the maiden knew not sorrow until an evil day when riding lone across the moors a hunter lost his way and chancing on this valley he met the maiden sweet her beauty overwhelmed him he fell lovesick at her feet despite the fervent warnings of her friends and flowers and trees she listened to his courting and with him roamed the lees the lees far from the valley they rode the livelong night till a heavy mist descending hid the roadway from their sight uprose then forms of evil from out the mocking gloom and seizing horse and hunter scared left the maiden to her doom travellers now within those regions through the nightly grey fog see a woman's shade crawl slow along to a ghastly melody and those who linger follow the phantom pale and wan o'er hill and dale and rill and vale it slowly leads them on on till they reach the valley a valley grim and drear where lurid things with fibrous arms their course through darkness steer and on the travellers palsied in frenzied crowd they pour and those who view their faces are heard but seen no more do you mean to say she dreamed all that gladys exclaimed yes the vicar's wife said she told me so and i have no reason to doubt her she doesn't romance as a rule and is certainly not the least bit in the world poetical on the contrary she is most practical and matter-of-fact her only hobby as far as i know is flowers mine too gladys interrupted were you able to explain the verses no i can't interpret dreams i'm intensely interested in them as i am in all things psychic i was at a lecture given by mrs annie besant last night she do you know anyone who does interpret dreams gladys asked why yes a firm claiming to do all sorts of wonderful things to tell dreams solve tricks divine the presence of metals and water and so on has just set up in cockspur street i read a short notice about them in this morning's paper i will get it for you she left the room and in a few moments returned here it is she said and under the heading of sorcery revived gladys read as follows there is really no end to the devices to which people resort nowadays to make money but for sheer novelty nothing we think beats this three americans messieurs hamar kelson and curtis fresh from san francisco california have just bought premises in cockspur street southwest and set up there as sorcerers they style themselves the modern sorcery company limited and profess to interpret dreams read people's thoughts tell their past solve all manner of tricks and detect the presence of metals and water one wonders what next the paper evidently has its doubts gladys commented they are frauds of course i dare say they are the vicar's wife replied though i believe in thought-reading and other things they say they can do 
i advised miss rosenberg to see them about her dream she went in by the nine o'clock train had you come a few minutes earlier you would have seen her well thanks awfully gladys said for telling me about these people very probably i'll go into town some time during the day and call it cockspur street i must apologize again for calling at such an unearthly hour good-bye and gladys smilingly took her departure end of chapter eight read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california